Hi, um, I'll be presenting my paper using deep learning to automatically detect epileptic seizure in a wearable device. This paper was written with Professor Elias Teodoro da Silva from the Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciência da Computação of the Federal Institute of Ceará. So, uh, let's, during this presentation, I will give you a brief introduction and background information that will help you understand better the concepts discussed in the paper. Then I'll talk a little bit about the state of the art, um, discuss our method, then I'll show you the results that we've achieved, and then I'll finish up with some conclusions. So a little bit about the introduction. So what exactly is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a chronic disease. That means it doesn't have a, a cure. And it's a disease that affects around 40 million people in the world. And from these, 30% of these people, they, even though they take um, medicine, they, you know, they are submitted to some um, drug use they cannot control when their seizures are going to happen. <clears throat> so it is a very interesting topic to try and detect when these seizures happen or try to predict these seizures. And usually the diagnosis for epilepsy is given by the analysis of EEGs, electroencephalographies, and these are simply 1D signals from the from electrodes mounted on the scalp, usually on the scalp um, of the patient. And by analyzing the waveforms and the patterns, a doctor can decide if the person has or if they don't have epilepsy. It is also very important to talk a little bit about what is seizure detection and seizure prediction. So seizure detection, as the name says, it's when we try to identify when a seizure is happening. And it's a very important topic because some, um, some drugs can only be uh, administered when the patient is having a seizure. It is also important to know when a seizure is happening because you know we can act on that and you know, we can help the patient go through the seizure and things like that. And then we have seizure prediction, which is, as name says, trying to predict when a seizure is happening, is going to happen, actually. Um, we also have uh, two types of you know, machine learning models. Um, we have the patient-specific models that are developed using data from a single patient. And we have cr cross-patient models, uh, you know, we have we grab the data, the EEG data from different patients, and we try to develop a model with that. And um, because the brainwave patterns from different patients are very, you know, hectic and different from each each patient, um, it is quite difficult to develop a cross-patient model. And most of the works out there, they concentrate on developing a patient-specific model. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the state of the art. So the first relevant work on trying to um, trying to find uh, seizures in EEG, EEG signals was developed in 2009 um, and it, they used a SVM to analyze raw signal data for a single from a single patient data set. So, They've developed a data set with multiple patients, but they've developed a model for each one of the patients using um, their own you know, subset of data. Then uh, in 2018, we start seeing some deep learning techniques, uh, CNNs, but mostly focusing on trying to change the signal from the time domain to the frequency domain or transforming the, si the signal into images which are, you know, which are better suited for CNNs. So not many works were concentrating on using CNNs on the raw um, signal. 
However, in 2019, we have CISNET, which is one of the first architectures that concentrate on applying uh, CNNs to a raw uh, EEG data. So we don't transform the data into anything to other domains, we just use the time uh, dependent data. And then in 2018, we have an example of uh, an SVM that was mounted uh, or was ported to a embedded platform and mounted on a uh, glass using these these techniques to try and detect when a seizure is happening. And most of these works, actually all of these works, they concentrate on uh, patient specific models. So for our work, we wanted to answer this question. We wanted to know um, what are the challenges to try and have a CNN architecture ported to any embedded platform, considering that these platforms usually have low resources and things like that. So let's talk about the method. The data set that we used is known as the CHB MIT. It's for CHB stands for Children Hospital Boston, and it contains 23 patients, uh, EEG from 23 patients, uh, but 24 data files. So we have one patient that is repeat, uh, has you know two data files, but in total we have 23 patients, and these EEGs they were sampled at a 256 hertz, uh, with a resolution of uh, 16 bits. And we have 23 channels available. So the channels, they correlate with the, uh, the montage of the electrodes that were used. So for this work, we use the 1020, uh, uh, for this data set, they use the 1020 montage. So usually the channels are represented as the differential between two electrode uh, voltages. So we have 23 channels and 844 hours of um, you know, EEG data with 163 seizure episodes with various lengths. Uh, we had to apply some data preparation in order to submit the data to the architecture, to the, the architecture that we chose. So uh, we had to downsample to 200 Hertz because that's what the architecture is expecting. And then we split the data in windows of five seconds. And we had to apply a data balancing technique uh, that we used overlap. So for negative samples, we didn't apply overlap at all. So there is no overlap. We just cut at every five seconds. But for positive samples, we cut at 0 0.075 seconds for so we generate new samples and then we have a better balancing of the data since the amount of, of you know, seizure data is far less than uh, negative data. So this is an example of a negative EEG signal, one of the channels only, and this is an example of a positive one. Uh, the CNN architecture that we use was the CISNAT architecture. It has four convolutional layers, four max pool layers, two fully connected layers, and we applied uh, dropout and batch norm to, to each one of the, of the layers. The training process, uh, we used the Keras framework to do that. So the Keras framework is, uh, is very known in the machine learning community. Uh, and we used a data split of 63% of the data was for training, 27% uh, for validation, and then 10% for testing. We trained on a GPU using the Atom optimizer. Uh, we developed 72 models for intra-patient inter uh, or for patient specific. We developed 72 models because we have 24 data files and we developed one model for three uh, channel numbers that we've, chose, we've chosen. So we've picked uh, two, 13, and 23 channels, and we developed a model for each one of these channel numbers. So we wanted to evaluate as well the impact of the number of the channels in the classification. Uh, we also developed three models with all of the available data. So we've you know put together all of the, the data files 
and develop three models, one for each uh, channel number, 2, 13, and 23. We've chosen these numbers because they represent the minimum, the maximum, and the midpoint between the number of channels, and then this would give us a good idea of how the, this number influence in the classification. We've done 10 times repetition uh, to retrieve metrics and things like that. Uh, to choose the embedded platform, we've made a memory cost estimation based on the architecture. So we've picked the highest number, as you can see, the highest, uh, this, uh, the highest uh, number that we have in the estimation, and we picked a uh, platform according to that. So we've chosen this ARM Cortex M7, and it has this uh, 2016 megahertz clock and one megabyte of flash. So you know we would be able to store the the, the network there. So as for the results, as you can see, this is the results per channel. And we can see that there is a lot of difference between 2 and 13, but not much difference between 13 and 23, meaning that around 13 is a good point, uh, a good number of channels to choose. Um, and this is the results per patient data, you know, per date patient file. And as you can see, the results are pretty, pretty good, all of them above 90%. And as for the memory uh, usage, you can see that we have uh, the RAM usage, and this is given by the platform after we port the network into the platform. Um, and then the platform porting system gave us the option to apply some compression to the number. So we had three levels of compression, and we did some testing around that too, to see if the compression um, affected the classification accuracy and it only influenced the accuracy of two channel models and only by uh two percent so not much uh not many not many changes there uh, and then our ideal model could be the 13 channel model with eight times compression because we would have around 115 kilobytes of ram used and around 202 uh, K of flash used. Uh, and then we have the time. Uh, we did some experiments around the inference time in the M7, and we also had a, a similar code applied in the A53. And as you can see, we have a huge difference from one uh, to the other. Okay. So, in conclusion, uh, our architecture it presents good performance in all of our experiments, you know, all of these numbers that you've seen, they are from the platform experiments from the embedded system point of view, and the results are really good, uh, all above 90%. <clears throat> the embedded platform outlined uh, shows a possibility for a wearable device. So uh, as you can see, we have all of the, you know, the past in all of the proofs that we can develop a wearable device from the platform that we've chosen. And the inference time when compared with other works is 17 times better. So we've made some comparisons with previous works, you know, developing uh, this solution in a embedded platform with other algorithms, FCM, other classification algorithms as well. And we've seen a 17 times improvement. Uh, and the final RAM usage, as you can see, was only 115K, and we had available 320. So that means we can use even a smaller um, platform and save some you know, money and space at the end. And this method that we've used it can also be applied for other tasks, you know, for porting other types of neural networks into embedded platforms. So for future works, uh, we wanted to identify key channels. What are the best channels and the ones that you do better performance? Uh, we want to have more architecture focus, architectures focused on the cross patient problem. As I said, the cross patient problem is a very difficult because 
there's lots of vari variation inside the EEGs of a single patient and even you know from different patients so it's very hard for these algorithms to find a pattern there and we want to explore other compression techniques um, and that's it so these are our references and uh, thank you for your time <laughs>